engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. It's nine after the hour. This is Eric Erickson, and you're listening to Atlanta's Evening News on WSB. The phone number is 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. T-A-L-K, for those of you who can't remember that it's a runoff day. It is a runoff day. Brad Raffensberger versus John Barrow for Secretary of State and Chuck Eaton versus someone whose name I cannot remember uh, running for the Public Service Commission. Uh, no disrespect intended. It's just all I know is Chuck Eaton is in a runoff against somebody and you need to go vote for Chuck Eaton. Uh, hold your nose at the Secretary of State's race, but go vote for Chuck Eaton. Um, I, I've got to tell you, and, and I'll, I'll spend more time on the runoff later because I really want to talk about the president as tariff man, but I cannot find anyone in the Republican Party in Georgia to say anything good about their Secretary of State nominee. I have found more Republicans willing to say nice things about John Barrow uh, than against their own Republican nominee who probably should be building some bridges. I assume he's going to get elected. Uh, the Republican, I assume Brad Raffensperger is going to win. Uh, Republicans tend to be favored in turnoff here. Although I do have to tell you, Democrats uh, waited until the end and kicked in their, their turnout machine. Uh, Republicans, I think we're sitting back thinking, Oh, the Democrats aren't doing, we don't have to respond. Democrats waited until Friday kicked on their turnout machine. And on Friday, there were line long lines Early voting in the metro area and Republican areas have seen good turnout, but nothing like what the Democrats were able to produce on Friday. If the Democrats can replicate it in metro Atlanta today, they may very well win both seats. There are only two seats on the ballot. Now, there are around the state some runoffs uh, here and there, but this is the big one. It is Secretary of State. The Democrats would love to win this race. And I think they did a deliberate campaign strategy of keeping their head down, laying low, targeting Democratic voters likely to vote in runoffs, and suburban female general-only voters who also vote in runoffs, and then kicking into high gear on Friday to turn them out, plus today. Now, robocalls will be over after today, so the election officially ends at 7 p.m., except in parts of Fulton County where the vote will be extended because they screwed up opening polls in some precincts. We will delve further into the runoff election here later. Right now, though, we need to get to uh, the president of the United States, who is saying he is tariff man, and he likes tariffs for the sake of tariffs. And this is a departure from the president. Uh, the president had originally said, oh, and this is breaking news right now. Uh, Roger Stone's attorney has informed the Senate Judiciary Committee Roger Stone will take the fifth and will not produce documents requested by the committee as the Mueller investigation winds down. At some point, i got to spend more time with you guys on the Mueller investigation. I've been waiting for the report, but things are winding down there. There's just so much going on, but we'll get there. It is the, the tariff issue that has Washington buzzing today. The president in the past had said he did not like tariffs, but he felt tariffs were necessary to try to get new deals from various governments. He has gotten a new NAFTA deal, and there's really nothing in the NAFTA deal that's new other than farmers in Florida uh, stand to be at a loss. Marco Rubio has come out and said if this goes before the Senate, he's going to vote against it. Uh, Rick Scott possibly will be voting against it as well because they think Florida farmers will get hurt. They'll be left with a short end of the stick. There's also now a question as to whether or not the president has the authority to get out of NAFTA itself. Uh, but the president today came out and said he was tariff man, that, that he, he thought tariffs were good. This is a big, big departure from what the president had said in the past and there's a lot of data out there to suggest now that this may not be a good thing. Now, the president and tariffs. Here is the problem with tariffs. The president's argument about China is a sound argument. You know what China is listed as with the World Trade Organization? China is listed as, with the World Trade Organization, a developing country, not a developed country. They were listed as a developing country 20 years ago. And it's never been changed. And China is now a developed country for all intents and purposes. And its designation should be changed. And in the World Trade Organization, 
because China is listed as a developing nation and not a developed nation, it is allowed some flexibility and exemptions that developed nations are not allowed. And it's been taking advantage of that. The president, though, with his tariffs on China, I know many of you who hated tariffs until the president told you they were good and now call in here all the time telling me how wonderful tariffs are because uh, China has tariffs, too, and you've completely conflated multiple stories together to come up with something that's not true. Nonetheless, you're going to defend tariffs because the president is defending tariffs. Here's the problem with that approach. The president could have gone to the World Trade Organization with Western European leaders and said China is no longer a developed nation. It's a developing nation. Or it's no longer developing. It's developed. Uh, we got to change this. And the World Trade Organization would hear it. You'd have all these Western powers together. They could probably get China to developed status. The other thing the president could have done is he could have gone to the World Trade Organization and said, listen, here's the problem. The Taxes that sheriff, that China imposes on American goods aren't actually the problem. No one actually believes the tariffs that China imposes on our goods is the problem, except for the people who heard the president say they're good. Now, suddenly they've decided they're good after years of saying they're bad. Now, the problem with China is not that the tariffs are there. The problem with China is that American companies have to hand over intellectual property for vetting by the Chinese authorities. And what happens when you hand over the intellectual property of the United States to the Chinese is the Chinese steal it because they're commies. And then suddenly you have Chinese companies making knockoff American goods. There's an issue. What the president could do is redress this by the World Trade Organization. What he's done is the thing he should not have done. The president imposed tariffs on a bunch of countries, not just China. And what did those countries do? Those countries began trading with each other at a discount. So the cost of American goods has gone up. The cost of Chinese goods in the United States has gone up. But the Chinese, Europe, Africa, the rest of Asia, South America, and Canada are now trading with each other at discounts to offset the tariffs from the United States. So they have, uh, collectively, the entire world has put themselves in a position where they've shut us out of trade because of the president's tariffs. What he wanted to happen didn't actually happen. He could have gone about this in a different way. But the president is the product of a bygone era, the 1950s, and decided that tariffs were good. Now, ironically, the United States in the 1950s was beginning to get rid of tariffs. But there's a compound problem to all of this. We have a lot of data now to suggest the economy is headed into a fragile state. It's not just the stock market that is declining. Savings is declining Consumer debt is going back up. It had been already up. Inflation has been going up. Uh, businesses are cutting back on purchasing power and purchases. Uh, American farmers are seeing their crop purchases abroad decline as China and these other countries begin to trade with each other. Prices are going up, keeping American consumers out. All of these things suggest the United States is heading towards an economic slowdown. And having tariffs on top of the other data, that's uh, the other issues that are already out there, is not a good thing for the American economy. If the president actually imposes tariffs, further tariffs on China, it's going to continue to hurt us more than China. And again, the reason it's going to hurt us more than China is because the European leaders and the Chinese and the Canadians and the Southeast Asians have decided they will just cut us out of the picture and we'll trade with each other. And Brazil stepped in to replace American farmers. And Europe stepped in to replace American purchasing power. And we're left holding the short end of the stick. The tariffs haven't worked out the way the president wanted. But I realize, because he said they're good, there will always be those who say they're good, despite all the evidence now to the contrary, as we head into a period of economic slowdown. Let's go to the phones, 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Scott from Augusta, you are first tonight. Welcome. Hey, it must be a slow news day. I got on so quick. <laughs> well, you know, I try occasionally to take phone calls early in the show. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. What, what's your suggestion to uh, 
something besides tariffs. Several. As a, um, as a strategy, not as a policy. Right, uh, several. Uh, one is to go to the World Trade Organization. Uh, and oh, they've, been, they've been so good to us lately. Well, actually, you know, we, we've won seven of the last ten complaints we've lodged before the World Trade Organization. So yeah. I would go to the World Trade Organization with the European countries who have been trying to push the president to go with them to get, China, get the World Trade Organization to upgrade China to developed nation status. Uh, you got the every single one of the European countries there, most of the South American countries, the United States, Canada, and Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, and India are all on board doing that, which gives them a majority of the World Trade Organization if the president would just file the case. Uh, it looks like Great Britain is going to be making that case since we're not doing it, and I think they'll win. The other thing to do is to pass the Trans-Pacific Partnership. One of the things China has been able to do is go to all the other countries that would be part of the, and, and I'm talking about the Trump revised, not not the Obama negotiated Trans-Pacific Partnership. The president has tweaked it uh, and hasn't signed it. But right now, China has gone to all the other participants in the the Trans-Pacific Partnership and is trading with them at subsidized rates to undercut the United States over these tariffs. If you get all of them in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, they can't do business with countries that are engaged in unfair trade with us. So you undercut China instead of them undercutting us. It's not that hard. Tariffs just aren't the way to do it. It is 39 after the hour to answer a question real quick. Um, So I had mentioned it before. I don't want to take up a ton of time here with it, but you text the word recipe to 345345 345, and you'll get by email Wednesdays around 1215 an email from me with just a recipe. It is free, not selling your information, Um, just a recipe once a week. Uh, Why? Because I think not enough of us actually cook decent stuff. We get intimidated by all the massive, complicated recipes online. Uh, So just simple, good stuff to cook. Uh, Cookies, roasts, salad tomorrow, gumbo, that sort of stuff. That's it, though. Uh, You don't get a text message back with the recipe. You actually get it emailed to you. Now, we can move on to the runoff. Uh, You've got Brad Raffensperger versus John Barrow. Um, I got to tell you that... I can't find Republicans to say much kind, if any kind, about their Secretary of State nominee compared to John Barrow. They're very, very frustrated. Uh, Raffensperger has a good campaign consultant. Uh, His campaign consultant has a good record. And best I can tell is that the campaign consultant is not being listened to. Um, and everyone seems very perplexed. There have been rumors of fundraisers canceled and um, money not spent. I, I have no idea what's going on with the race. I, I can tell you I tried to get him on the program in the run-up to the runoff. Uh, did not get any responses. Multiple people uh, made inroads. I texted his cell phone, uh, did not hear back, and it, it did not work out. I don't know what's going on. And I had several people tell me that he he didn't need anybody's help in the runoff and didn't think he needed or didn't need anybody's help with the primary, didn't need anybody's help with the general, and he didn't need anybody's help with the runoff, uh, mine included. So there you have it. We'll see if he wins. I suspect he does. Uh, and here's the thing. If he wins, I think he's going to have to rebuild some bridges with Republicans in the state legislature who are very aggravated, largely because Chuck Eaton is in a runoff. And Chuck Eaton had about a million dollars or so spent against him specifically because he was portrayed as being in the pocket of Georgia power, which is not true. Uh, Chuck, along with the majority, if not all, of the Public Service Commission, decided we were so far in with Plant Vogel at this point, we might as well see it through. And I think they're right on that. Uh, It should have probably never been authorized on the current plan, but it was. And I think it would be crazy for the Public Service Commission to ditch it. Um, Bubba McDonald, I think, has, has steered the ship there in the right direction when it comes to Plant Vogel. And Georgia Power, I think, mishandled this, and that's not the Public Service Commission's fault. And perhaps they can steer clear of it. But Chuck Eaton in particular has been attacked pretty savagely by Democrats claiming that he is a tool of Georgia power. 
He is not. He is his own man. He is a very good man, and I probably would not have gone to vote for the runoff, but for Chuck Eaton being on the ballot. You can still go vote until 7 o'clock. I will actually be here until 8 o'clock tonight uh, as the runoff results begin to come in across the state. Fulton County has delayed closing in a couple of precincts, probably not enough to affect the margin of victory for either candidate, but there were a couple of precincts in Fulton County that were slow starting One of them had electrical problems. Another, they didn't have enough supplies and had to go get more supplies to be able to open the the polling locations. There's no fraud or anything. It's just typical Fulton County ineptness. Um, But polling closes at 7 everywhere else, so you still have time to go vote. And it's going to be interesting to see what the runoff margins are. The reason it will be interesting to see what the runoff margins are. So here's why this runoff in particular is interesting is are the Democrats able to make a sustained go of it in ground game for runoff? The conventional wisdom in Georgia, and I think it's still right, is that Georgia is still largely a Republican state and that Republicans consequently have an advantage when it comes to runoffs. It used to be that Democrats had the advantage. Y'all, you do know that's why libertarians have ballot access in Georgia, right? The Republicans would do very well to make sure that the Green Party is more viable in the state uh, as as demographics shift in Georgia. The Libertarian Party got ballot access because the Democrats in Georgia recognized the Republican Party was surging and knew they still had an, an ultimate advantage if they could get into a runoff. So they put the Libertarians on the ballot who could pick up 2 or 3%, hold the Republicans back, keep everybody below 50%, and then jump into a runoff and beat the Republican. Well, the tide changed eventually, and the Libertarians now can get everybody into a runoff, but then that gives the Republicans an advantage now in Georgia. I still think that's the case. All the Democrats and Republicans I've talked to still think that's the case, but here's something that's a little different from in ages past. The Democrats have outraised the Republicans in both the Public Service Commission race and in the Secretary of State race. They have done some robocalling. They have done some targeted mailing. Essentially, what both sides have done more or less is they've looked at all the people who have a, if I can talk, a propensity. That's the word I want, not a propitiation. A propensity. Leave it to somebody in seminary to about to say propitiation instead of propensity. Uh, they have a propensity to vote in runoffs. Both sides have gone and found those people and they have targeted them and they've mailed them absentee ballot applications. They have showed up at their door by and large, but the Democrats did it much more under the radar than the Republicans. And as a result, the Republicans are trying to see if they can match the ground game with the Democrats uh, in the state of Georgia as this has happened. And I apologize. Someone left a speaker on in the, in the room I'm in. So suddenly there was a phone call voicemail, um, which is why I'm talking very loud into the microphone. I guess that's why I should probably go to break now. Technical difficulties here. (laughs) I have no idea. I just heard someone's voice and thought it was Siri, but I can't cuss out Siri on the radio or I would get in trouble on the radio. So I looked at my phone and it wasn't that realized, oh, someone's turned a speaker up in the office so I can hear when we get voicemails in. It's very weird around here today. I'm going to explain that when we come back. Trust me, you're going to want to hear this. It is 55 after the hour. Eric Erickson here. There is a gift that everybody is buzzing about because it buzzes. Even Oprah Winfrey has it on her O list. It's perfect for you if you have a mouth, and that would be everyone. It is the Quip Electric Toothbrush, which is a toothbrush I have used for maybe two years after I kept seeing the ads on Instagram. had a buddy of mine who sold me on it because he had a podcast, and they were an endorser, and he's obsessive-compulsive, and he loves it. So I decided I'd give it a try because I wanted a, an electric toothbrush that was not so massive, and you didn't have to carry around the charger. And this is what the Quip does. It, they even send you a new brush head every three months. I've actually got one. just came in on my desk, new brush head. Uh, comes every three months for 5 bucks. You even get a battery in the envelope, and the battery is a AAA, and it works. Every 30 seconds, it pulses, turns itself off after two minutes, so you get the dentist recommended two-minute toothbrush, and you know when to change sides every 30 seconds. It's just, it's a well-designed product. I really do like this toothbrush, having gone, I mean, I you name the fancy brands you get at the grocery store or, or the department store, 
I've had them, and they are a waste of money. You need the Quip. The Quip is only 25 bucks, and it is so worth it. You get it by going to getquip.com slash Erickson right now. You get your first brush head refill pack for free with the Quip Electric Toothbrush. You don't have to tell anybody that if you're stuffing a stocking with it. It's your first refill pack for free at getquip.com slash Erickson. So, a few years ago, I developed an allergy to pine sap. I know. I'd never had this problem before. And it's probably been five or six years now. And I just break out into hives if I get in a juniper bush or I get into pine, uh, evergreen, I guess. And so we can't get a real tree at our house. So I had to get a fake tree. And, you know, we decided we moved into a new house that had high ceilings. I was getting an 11 foot tall tree. Nobody told me it's 100 pounds. I didn't even go to CrossFit yesterday. I went to CrossFit Christmas tree yesterday trying to get the damn thing into the house. It comes into four pieces and the base of it's 50 pounds alone. It's ridiculous. But I finally got it up and hallelujah, praise the Lord, my own festival of lights, miracle of lights, all of the lights on the Christmas tree work. But in the process, had to rearrange stuff in the dining room and found the phone we'd been looking for forever and put it on the charger. Apparently the speaker was turned on, which is that that was. I mean, the whole house is turned upside down trying to get ready for Christmas. Why do we do this to ourselves? because we love sweet little baby Jesus, I guess, and the lights outside. I still got to finish decorating at some point. It's not going to happen tonight, though, because I'm on radio until 8 o'clock. We'll be back. After the hour, I am Eric Erickson. This is Atlanta's Evening News on WSB. The phone number 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Polls are still open. For the next hour, you can go out and vote. Yes, believe it or not, the election is ongoing. There is a runoff today for Secretary of State and Public Service Commission. And that's not all. Speaking in California... To her base of donors, that's where she, I think, got most of her money. Stacey Abrams said Monday, according to Politico, she's considering running for the Senate in 2020 or governor in 2022 or possibly even for president. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here's a, here's a, here's a funny, funny paragraph in here. Abrams largely circulated under the 2020 radar. Even as another failed statewide candidate, Texas Representative Beto O'Rourke, draws intense interest from donors and Democratic activists. Isn't that kind of the problem that she had in in 2018? Is is Beto O'Rourke sucked all the oxygen out of the room? It was only in the last month of the campaign when all the polls made it very clear there was no way on God's good earth Beto O'Rourke was going to win in Texas. Did people suddenly say, oh, wait, hey, look, it's Stacey Abrams. Who's she? And they started paying attention. Now, what's so funny is that Abrams was delivering her remarks at a progressive donor network called Way to Win. It funneled $22 million into the 2018 election. And it appears now she's on a trajectory to challenge David Perdue with the backing of this group. And can I say one of the major, major reasons that Abrams had to put up the show she put up after the election is because she had to convince her donors that the race was stolen. Because Abrams has been grifting off these people since before 2014, raising money, claiming she's going to do a voter registration effort. She was going to swing Georgia blue in 2014, and it collapsed. And it left a lot of ill will with Democrats in Georgia in particular because they really thought she was taking money out of the system that could have been used elsewhere more constructively in an effort to build herself up at Jason Carter and Michelle Nunn's expense in 2014. And so then she she came back. She did this this time. She couldn't even make it into a runoff. She did get close, but she didn't even make it into a runoff. And even Jim, what, Jim Martin or whatever was able to get Saxby Chambliss into a runoff. 
back in 2002, was it? She wasn't able to do that, and she's got to come up with an excuse. Why did she worked on this in 2014? Some say at the expense of Jason Carter and Michelle Nunn. Why wasn't she able to win? And the excuse is, well, the Republicans stole it. Uh, Brian Kemp was in charge of it. You know, the Democrats believe it. The Democrats, seriously, the majority of Democrats out there really believe Brian Kemp stole the election. They don't care about the facts. The facts are wrong. Um, it's just, just fascinating to me uh, that the Democrats are willing to believe so much mythology right now. They're willing to believe the Russians actually stole the election. They're willing to believe Brian Kemp stole the election. Whenever the Democrats don't win, it is their their assumption that, well, they could only lose if it was stolen from them, which to some degree gives the Republicans a bit of a way forward in that the Democrats don't think they've done anything wrong. They think everything's been stolen from them. And so they don't realize that it's people rejecting their message. And so they just keep amplifying their message over and over. If they scream louder, they think that they'll be able to get more votes and, and they'll win even bigger as opposed to, well, losing like they've done. I mean, Democrats had a good year in 2018, and they still saw the Republicans pick up seats in the Senate and hold some seats that they should have never been able to hold. And yet they did because the Democrats went full bore progressive, including here in Georgia, which, by the way, you should know this is part of the Democrats' message moving forward, is that Stacey Abrams got close to Brian Kemp because she went full progressive. So now next time they need to go even more progressive. That's actually what they're seriously considering. I'm not making that up. Thank you very much. You know, it's not just Stacey Abrams talking about 2020. Michael Avenatti today released a statement. He's not going to run after all. (gasps) What's so funny to me is people are coming out, giving their take that, The Democrats are not actually ready for their own Donald Trump in 2020, which is hogwash. They're desperate for one, and they were drooling all over Avenatti until he was accused of of, uh, hitting a woman, and now suddenly they're upset about him. But they were flirting with him because they thought he could beat Donald Trump. They say he was being invited to give uh, Jefferson Jackson Day, or I guess they don't call it the Jackson dinners anymore, the Jefferson Obama or whatever dinners. And he was everybody was excited about him until this. Well, there are a ton of Democrats running and leave it to the Washington Free Beacon to get a montage together of all these people thinking of running for president. Are you running for president in 2020? Are you running in 2020? Do you plan on running for president in 2020? I've got a lot of work in the Senate. That's not a no. Well, I'm, I'm seriously considering it. I, I'm thinking hard about it. Considering right. And afterwards, you'd take a look at it. Absolutely, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm thinking about it. We're seriously thinking about it. I'm not ruling it out. We certainly are looking at it. Well, I've been very straightforward that, that I'm thinking about running. Am I going to think about it? Yeah, I'm going to think about it. Hey, look, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. I would not be honest with you if I didn't say that I'm thinking of running. I am just still um, thinking about this, talking to people. Not sure what future will hold in our respect. I promise I'm thinking about it really hard, Elaine. I think about whether or not I should run. I will take a hard look at running for president. I'm seriously thinking about how I can best be of service. Uh, during the holidays, I'm going to sit back and uh, uh, meet with family, friends. Are you ruling out running for president in 2020 or no, not? No, I, that, that's another year. Would you be open to it? Sure, I would never close the door. Well, look, I might. Amy and I made a decision not to rule anything else in, in in due course whether or not that uh, has anything to do with me will re- remains to be seen but do you want to run again no wait no that was a pause well i well i'd like to be president okay uh. <laughs> man can you imagine if hillary clinton runs again i'm actually yeah y- y- i don't want you guys to take this the wrong way because i'm not advocating it and i need to say maybe i need to like say that after every word, I'm not advocating it, but I actually, I'm not advocating it, actually am interested to see, I'm not advocating it if any Republicans challenge the president, but I'm not advocating it. I I don't want you to think I'm endorsing it. The only reason I'm saying is because I I know uh, Jeff Flake says he's looking. John Kasich has never stopped running for president. Um, Bob Corker, I'm led to believe, is considering it. Uh, there is an effort underway to draft Ben Sass. Uh, there are a lot of people who want, I, I think the Republican party has become the party of Donald Trump. And I don't think that any of these people could run for president, but I do have to tell you, looking at the exit polling data, the adjusted exits, not the bad exits, the adjusted exits that are actually really good, that there does appear to be a segment of the Republican party that wants someone else. And a lot of those people voted Democrat. 
this time as a repudiation of the president. There's actually some data out there. Uh, I, for, I think it was YouGov, a uh, pretty good pollster, looked at the poll, the women who tend to vote Republican but decided to vote Democrat this year. And why? You know what? Three quarters of them said, three quarters of the women who tend to vote Republican but voted Democrat this year, what they said, it's that they don't like the president's behavior. They don't care about the policies. They're concerned about the president's behavior. By the way, 90%, 90% of the women who voted Republican this year said they care about results, not the president's behavior. And they like the results, uh, which is pretty striking there. The, un, unfortunately for, for Republicans, they, per, the propensity of women out there was to vote based on a, I, I don't mean this disparaging to women. It just, it's the polling shows there was an emotional reaction against the president. They voted based on that emotional reaction. They voted against Republicans. They don't like the president's behavior. They don't like the way he attacks people and stuff like that. Uh, if you can get women to overcome that by saying, look, look, the Democrats have someone even crazier, worse, more awful than Donald Trump. Maybe they'll go back to Donald Trump. It's going to be very interesting these next few years, seeing how the parties position themselves. The Republicans are talking a really good game about turning up their base for 2020, but they fundamentally know, and the president also understands, he's got to grow his base for 2020. He's got to get some of it back and grow it. Where do they do that, though? They're actually thinking Wisconsin may be a path forward for them, even though the Democrats scored big there. It's 26 after the hour. Eric Erickson here. You can still go vote. You got more than 30 minutes. And remember, once you're in line, they can't throw you out of line. Uh, Even if you get there just before 7 o'clock. It is the runoff. The phone number here is 404-872-0750. 1-800-WSB-TALK. Have you guys heard what PETA has done? Uh, First of all, they had the Independent, a British publication, run a story on veganism and how, uh, you know, uh, saying bring home the bacon or I've got a beef with this, that that these are offensive phrases to vegans and they're going to become passe. And this afternoon, PETA has issued a graphic on social media. Words matter. As our understanding of social justice evolves, our language evolves as well. Here's how to remove speciesism from your daily conversations. Instead of kill two birds with one stone, it's feed two birds with one scone. Except the whole purpose of this is you're actually like getting rid of things. Instead of be the guinea pig, it's be the test tube. Instead of beat a dead horse, it's feed a fed horse. Instead of bring home the bacon, it's bring home the bagels. Instead of taking the bull by the horns, it's take the flower by the thorns. This is PETA, folks. This is the the company that is running a billboard in Atlanta with a picture of a cow that says, I am me. See me as a person. I kid you not. This, This organization has lost its mind. It's gone nuts. People don't really believe this stuff, do they? I hope not. God help us if they do. My goodness gracious. It's Eric Erickson here. It is 39 after the hour. The phone number is 404-872-0750. 1-800-WSB-TALK. To the phones we go. Kevin in Woodstock. You are going to be next. Welcome. Eric, hey, thank you for taking my call, sir. Sure. I was trying to get in last night, and I just missed you. Y'all switched over to some UGA basketball. Oh, yes. But I have a great story for you. This okay. is back when I was about fifth grade, 12 years old. My grandmother was a volunteer for Jimmy Carter's campaign in 1975-76, and they were called the Peanut Brigade. With the inauguration of the Jimmy Carter Library here in Atlanta, I went down with my grandmother, Jane Hannon, to the inauguration. And to my surprise, there were three U.S. presidents and their wives, Reagan, Bush, and Carter. 
and their wives, and it was an outstanding event. And we got to all get in the line and go through and shake all of their hands. And it was one of the highlights of my life. Oh, that's pretty awesome. That is really neat. It was really cool. Uh, Reagan was the president at the time. Bush was the vice president. And, of course, Carter was the former president. But it was an outstanding time. And I just wanted to call you and let you know what a great time it was. The Bushes could not have been nicer, the Reagans and the Carters. But, of course, Secret Service had us moving through. Very oh, quick. yeah, I, I bet so, no doubt. Kevin, thanks very much for the phone call. You know, as a matter of fact, one of the things that has come out in the last 48 hours or so is the Bushes insisted uh, that before the public be able to view the casket in the Capitol, that any current or former White House staffers who wanted to could, uh, like housekeeping staff. The reason is the Bush family was known for being very, very gracious with the White House staff and the Secret Service. In fact, to the extent that both George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush originally refused to leave the White House or Camp David for Thanksgiving and Christmas until the end of the day. They would always spend Thanksgiving and Christmas morning in the residence at the White House or at Camp David, which is within a drive of D.C., because they wanted the staff in the White House and the Secret Service to be able to be home with their family, that they didn't want to burden them with travel during the holidays. So the Bushes would stay home, and sometimes in the afternoons or evenings of Thanksgiving or Christmas, would then fly back to Texas or go up to Kenny Bunkport. But for the meal and the main part of the day, would always stay in the White House or Camp David. And the White House staff and the Secret Service deeply appreciated that. Uh, I'm also told there, in fact, there was a great piece at the, uh, at CNN today by a former secret service agent who loved president Bush and said what really, um, stuck out in his mind is that in the nineties, when Clinton was president after the Oklahoma city bombing, uh, and then the, the, the branch Davidian thing or what have you, at some point, the NRA accused the ATF and the secret service and others of being a bunch of thugs or something. They, they, in some way attacked, um, federal law enforcement, and President Bush publicly uh, renounced his NRA lifetime membership that he'd had since forever um, in defense of his Secret Service agents and the ATF uh, that he had been the commander-in-chief of and president of, and they all really, really respected him for that, deeply loved this family. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say there's been an outpouring of affection, perhaps over the top um, by some, but the Secret Service and the White House staff absolutely loved this man and his wife. Uh, just very, very, very interesting. 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Those are the phone numbers. I've got to spend a few moments here talking about criminal justice reform. Chuck Grassley, the outgoing chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, said he intends to see this through this year. Um, The big obstacle in the Senate comes from Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, who is very much opposed to criminal justice reform. Mike Lee actually is one of the major Senate sponsors of the legislation. There seems to be a bipartisan consensus on this legislation, but uh, there's some conservative um, intransigence on the issue causing it not to move forward. I have studied the bill. Uh, I have talked to people on both sides of it. I've got to tell you, I I think I support criminal justice reform, and I'm, I'm a little more apprehensive now than I had been because so many people have jumped on the bandwagon. It's just my personality that I tend to be deeply skeptical of things in Washington when everybody comes out for them. Because, you know, the the story about Washington is you actually have the stupid party and the evil party and not the Republicans and the Democrats. And the stupid party and the evil party, they get together and every once in a while they do something that is both stupid and evil and it gets heralded by the press as a bipartisan accomplishment. And I'm afraid that is where we are headed with criminal justice reform with all sides now coming out saying it's a good idea. But I got to tell you, I have looked at it over and over. I think that constitutionally speaking, the Congress should have far fewer criminal laws. We have criminalized business conduct in this country in ways I don't think we should have. I think there are constitutional issues at stake, so I'm in favor of criminal justice reform at the federal level, in large part because I think that there should be far fewer criminal laws on the books for Congress. Uh, Crime is a state function. 
uh, in the federalism brackets of the Constitution. Crime is something the states, the several states should deal with, not something the federal government should deal with, except in limited circumstance. And I think that this criminal justice reform does a good job of rolling back some of those issues and leaving them state issues. And frankly, I think that's a good thing because most judges at the state level are elected. You can hold them accountable if they go wobbly, unlike federal judges who are there serving for life. I think it's a very good thing for us to advance the criminal justice legislation. And I have reached out to both Senator Cotton and Senator Lee to get more formal takes from them and maybe have them on the program to discuss it. But kudos to Chuck Grassley uh, and also to David Perdue and and Johnny Isaacson who are advancing the ball on criminal justice reform uh, with this bipartisan consensus. The only thing about it now that makes me skeptical is the bipartisan consensus, to be honest with you. It is 54 after the hour. Eric Erickson here. Amazing scene right now uh, in underneath the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. I'm going to jump over to the CNN feed here for just a minute as they're talking. The royal family that the Bushes have had a great relationship. President Bush over the years, is standing there in the rotunda with former First Lady, um, Bar- uh, not Barbara Bush, um, Laura Bush. Uh, Governor Jeb Bush of Florida and his wife and the rest of the family, they have come in and they are shaking hands with the people who are coming in to pay respects. They're taking pictures, uh, hugging people, getting hugged. Uh, They are meeting with the Senate and House pages now over to the side who have been standing there keeping watch over the casket this evening. Um, Just it's an amazing outpouring of affection for the Bush family from people who've come to pay their respects. Uh, Very, very, very just amazing to see. An interesting sight. Um, Mostly smiles today, although I've noticed several of the grandkids are crying there, standing by the casket. Um, When we come back, uh, I actually am going to be here for Mark Aram, and we're going to shift away from the hard news of the day. Uh, We're going to discuss... Probably the most controversial, so the president, he's he's now taking someone's baby out of their hand and is posing for pictures with the baby. (laughs) In any event, probably the most contentious, hardest, uh, most prone to fighting issue of the day, not the UGA Alabama game. Resquiscat and Pache. Nope, we are talking fake trees or real trees. In addition to how you decorate And is there any good places in the area that you would recommend to go see? Before we get there, though, the president of France has caved on the fuel tax. I I mentioned this yesterday, that the Western media has done a terrible job covering the riots in France. Now, part of the riots are, in fact, because the president of France has imposed some free market reforms on the banking and insurance industries in France. And the socialists in France hate it. But the primary impetus for the riots in France that have left Paris burning are a fuel tax to comply with the Paris Accord. And the president has now scrapped the fuel tax in France that was hitting hard farmers and others causing the riots in Paris. You would not know that from most press accounts of what's going on in in Paris and in France. Just another reminder of how the media shapes stories. (laughs) 